Well, we've now discussed the Leonard Jones intermolecular potential, and hopefully you enjoyed the demonstration of the liquefaction of oxygen from the air. It is intermolecular interactions that permit you to liquefy a gas to cause the molecules to stick together, and we got to see some of the more spectacular properties of liquid oxygen. Today, I'd like to spend some time focused on other intermolecular potentials besides the Leonard Jones, because they can uh, provide us with some information that can be interesting as well. And let me remind you that the virtue of having the intermolecular potential function is that we have a relationship between the potential, written on this slide in terms of U. U is a potential that depends on an in interparticle separation R and the second virial coefficient, in this case B2VT. And so by plugging in a given potential U into that integral expression, we can in fact compute by solution of the integral uh, B2V and understand how a real gas will behave. So I'd like to pause for a moment before looking at some different potentials by actually discussing the physics behind the various pieces of the Leonard Jones potential. And in particular, I'd like to look at the attractive term, which has r to the minus 6 dependence. And if we ask what, what sort of physical interactions do in fact diminish as r to the minus 6 as things grow further apart, the first is dipole-dipole interactions. So if our molecule has a permanent dipole moment, then there are two extreme possibilities for alignment. One is that the two dipoles are opposed to one another. So a dipole here represented by a negative charge and a positive charge. And since like charges repel, this would be a bad arrangement to these dipoles. On the other hand, they can also be head to tail. That's the maximally attractive arrangement of two dipoles. And it turns out that the dipole-dipole interactions between molecules are, are really quite small compared to thermal energy for typical molecules and typical temperatures we'd work with. And so the two dipoles are in fact tumbling with thermal energy. And as a result, we have to average over the many different accessible orientations. When one does that averaging, one discovers that the, the potential of interaction is given here. It depends on the square of the two individual dipole moments. Here's where you see temperature playing a role because it is causing these uh, dipoles to tumble. And then here's the r to the minus 6 dependence. And this is the permittivity of free space. Another r to the 6 interaction is a dipole-induced dipole interaction. So when a molecule with a permanent electrical moment, like this one with a dipole, is brought up to a molecule that does not have a permanent moment, maybe it's an atom, it will polarize the electron cloud of that atom and introduce an induced dipole. And so to emphasize that it's induction, I've put these little delta symbols here. It's sort of a small increase in positive charge to be near the region of negative charge in the permanent dipole. And when one works through the electrostatics in that, uh, one finds that if you have two systems, each of which, each of which does have a permanent dipole, the, the drawing here, only one of them does, but if they do, this is the most general formula, each permanent dipole can induce some additional dipole in the other, and the net interaction then goes as square of the individual dipole moments times the polarizability, that's what alpha is, so it's the ability to be polarized, uh, it, that's what it's a measure of, and again, permittivity of free space and an r to the minus 6 dependence. And then finally, a, a, a very important interaction that a physical chemist would call dispersion, and that is induced dipole, induced dipole interactions. So when two particles with no permanent electrical moments are brought together, particles with electron clouds, then because those clouds of electrons can move in a correlated fashion, they will instantaneously arrange themselves to have a favorable induced dipole-induced dipole interaction. That's an electron correlation phenomenon. And again, the equation has an r to the minus 6 dependence. It involves the ionization potentials of the two particles, their polarizabilities, and again, the permittivity of free space. So it turns out that although all of these different kinds of interactions show r to the minus 6 behavior, Really, the dispersion interactions dominate. They form a, the largest percentage of the total uh, interaction energy between two molecules. Dispersion is so important. Let's take one more moment to uh, take a look at it. It was first uh, given this 
relatively simple formula and described by Fritz London. It's a purely quantum mechanical effect. It has no classical analog. So it happens because of the correlated motions of electrons in quantum particles. If you just bring two uncharged classical species together in physics, they have no electrical interaction. They have no electrical moments, nothing. But uh, when the electrons are in motion about a nucleus, you can induce these moments. And as I mentioned on the, uh, on the last slide, these I terms appearing in the numerator are ionization energies, and they could be given in joules, for instance. Polarizability, which is the, the uh, propensity to allow an induced dipole to uh, be induced in your electron cloud about a nucleus, that is given in units of coulomb meter squared per volt. So a voltage would be, for instance, a field that could induce a dipole. And here's the permittivity of the vacuum or free space. And I'll just uh, mention again, dispersion, usually the dominant contrib uh, contribution to the r to the minus 6 attractive interaction that appears as the second term in the Leonard-Jones potential. Well, let's think about somewhat simpler potentials with the motivation being that when we plugged the Leonard-Jones potential into the relevant integral in order to solve for the second virial coefficient, we ended up with an integral that was impossible to solve analytically. But maybe we can gain a little bit of intuitive insight by using somewhat simpler forms for the potential where we really can solve that integral. And so two potentials I want to look at briefly one is the hard sphere potential, or the billiard ball potential, you might call it. So in the hard sphere potential, for a separation r greater than sigma, and sigma can be thought of as the diameter of a sphere, beyond that value sigma, there is no interaction. It's zero. So two things approach one another. They don't feel each other at all. And then at r equal to sigma, and for all values below it, the potential becomes infinite. That is, if you, if you think of sigma as being the diameter, then if I have two particles, think of billiard balls, that have a diameter of sigma, I will be able to bring them together until their two centers are separated by sigma. And at that point, since their radius is half of sigma, add together two halves of sigma, you'll get a sigma. At that point, they kiss. And they're billiard balls. They're very hard. They don't like each other. So they cannot go any further towards one another. In a real system, they might bounce off one another. But in any case, the potential becomes infinite. So no interaction, no interaction, no interaction, full stop, infinite potential. So that's a very easy one to write down. Uh, an alternative is to still have the square wall here, the repulsive wall at sigma, so still hard sphere contact. but over some interval, as the one sphere departs from the other, there will be an attractive interaction. And it's a constant, so it's called a square well potential because there's a well below zero in the potential, but it has a, a flat bottom, and it goes for a certain distance, and then it ends. And so if we describe that mathematically, we'd say for r less than sigma, infinite potential between sigma and let's use some multiple of sigma. So lambda is just a parameter. How far out do you feel the attraction? It is minus epsilon, so minus, meaning it's attractive. And then beyond that uh, multiple of sigma, it's zero again. So let's see how those potentials behave when we plug them in to the, uh, the integral expression for the second virial coefficient. And uh, let's start with the hard sphere model. So that has the simplest uh, mathematical formula. And let's pause for a moment to think, when might this be a good potential to describe the interaction between gas molecules? And so you would expect it to perhaps be relatively good at very high temperatures. At very high temperatures, the molecules are moving with a lot of speed. And so they don't necessarily need to feel an attraction to be drawn close to another molecule. Instead, they just keep going till they slam into one, and then they bounce off one another. And they behave kind of like billiard balls if billiard balls were moving with a lot of kinetic energy. So if the temperature is very high relative to uh, epsilon over Kb, so that's a, a measure of temperature, an attractive force divided by Boltzmann's constant, then we can pretty much ignore the attractive force and only worry about the repulsive part. So if I now uh, take the expression for the second virial coefficient and I simply plug in 
for u here, these values, I see that really I need to do two integrals. I need to do one integral from zero to sigma, and I'll plug in the potential, and it is infinite, so I get e to the minus infinity, so that's just zero. And then here's minus one, so I keep minus one, r squared dr. And then a second term will go from sigma to infinity, so I take e to the minus u, but u is now equal to zero. And so e to the zero is one, minus one, this entire integral drops out because I'm just integrating over zero. So all I'm left with is the integral from zero to sigma of r squared dr. And of course that is uh, r cubed over three. And we evaluate that at its limits and you end up after multiplying by the constants as two pi sigma cubed Avogadro's number divided by three. And if you work that out, that's, that's four times the volume of Avogadro's number of spheres having a diameter of sigma. And so that's kind of a measure of occluded volume can be uh, thought of. And that is what we expect the second virial coefficient to be, a positive number at high temperature because you can't access the whole volume that an ideal gas could because there is a finite size to the actual gas molecules. Notice that it's independent of temperature. So even though we have here that B2V is a function of temperature, this says it's just a constant. But if you remember your, uh, your plot of the second virial coefficient as a function of temperature, you'll recall that it goes up from low temperature, goes through the boil temperature, and then flattens out at very high temperatures. And it is effectively constant. So this is a, a good approximation for that at very high temperature. Now let's take a look at the square well model. And so in this case, when we plug in these three different conditions, infinite potential inside the hard wall, a region of attractiveness, and a region of no interaction, we'll have three different integrals. Still, this last one will go to zero, just as it did in the hard sphere case. The first one will also be the same as in the hard sphere case. So here is that hard sphere result multiplied times one. And then if you plug in minus epsilon, for the argument of the exponential in the uh, second integral, you'll end up with this expression. Lambda cubed minus one e to the positive epsilon over kt minus one. So in essence, this is a three parameter model then because we've got this new parameter lambda that tells us over what distance does the attractive interaction persist. And so this is just an indication of how this expression for the second virial coefficient fits to experimental data under certain conditions. So this is, these are data for nitrogen gas measured over a range of a little less than 100K. It looks like maybe this got all the way down to liquid nitrogen. Uh, that The boiling point of nitrogen is 77 Kelvin. And then up, up, up to quite high temperatures, 700 it looks like on here. And uh, the experimental data points are the open circles. And then if we treat the three parameters in this expression, sigma, epsilon, and lambda, as free parameters and just ask how, how can we best fit it, we end up with 328 picometers for the diameter of the molecule, 95.2 Kelvin for the, uh, the depth of the well expressed in these units, epsilon over KB, and finally the multiple of the diameter over which the attractive force is felt, 1.58, so not quite two uh, diameters away, it ceases to be an attractive interaction. And you see, if we actually compare that to the Leonard-Jones potential, which again involves sort of fitting to second virial coefficient, we get very, very similar numbers for the well depth and uh, just a slightly different diameter. The Leonard-Jones potential is not a hard wall potential. It rises as r to the 12th, so that's a little bit different. Well, so hopefully those provide some more insight into why the second virial coefficient behaves the way that it does and help to reinforce this idea that molecules at short distances are attracted to one another. As we go to higher temperatures, that attraction matters less as they start to interact more like hard spheres bouncing off one another. And we will be exploring uh, more gas behavior from first principles as we continue to go forward. That actually brings us to the end of the second week of material having to do with gases. And what I want to uh, finish up with for this week is a review of the most important concepts. So we'll move to that next.